Why don't we, uh, can we all stand and just welcome someone to worship this morning? Welcome, welcome your brother or sister into God's presence. And then when you're done, you can uh, have a seat. So uh, I don't know if you, like, just paid attention right now and just, like, you're able to just take in that passage. But I noticed Vivian's, this is the word of the Lord, wasn't actually, like, so confident this morning. And there's good reason for that. It's one of the most disputed passages in all of Scripture. It's one of the most difficult passages people um, have a hard time reconciling with who they think Jesus is, right? We see they think the Old Testament God uh, a lot of judgment, a lot of um, anger, a lot of uh, punishment. They think in New Testament, Jesus, a lot of grace and love. But this is the outlier. This passage is the outlier, right? So I have my work cut out for myself this morning to preach this passage, actually. It's a really difficult passage. And, but thank God um, I'm not doing this by myself. We have God to help me this morning, so... Let's, let's seek him this morning. Let's pray. Let's start with prayer and ask God to really speak through this passage what he wants to speak. Jesus, we want to just thank you this morning that you are the one who has knocked down all the barriers to come to you. And not just physically, but also spiritually, Lord. We are here today because you have knocked down barriers for us even personally, somehow, some way, we are here this morning because of your grace, because you've made the way. God, we pray that as we look into your word, that it would not just be ideas and knowledge and, and even insights, but Lord, we, we're, at, we're coming here this morning for a life transformed, for a heart transformed, for a renewed spirit that matches your spirit. So God, would you come and minister through this passage that is so difficult, that um, is so challenging, Lord? Would you be the one to really minister to people's hearts? And we know that if you do that, somehow, some way, we will be drawn closer to you in intimacy. So God, would you, would you lead this time as only you can? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, uh, there are difficulties in this passage, right? So let's look at some of these difficulties. Jesus, he performs miracles, right, in, in Scripture, Usually with these miracles are what? Like either he's bringing life to people, he's healing people, um, he's bringing order to a creation. And this is the first time in the Gospel of Mark where he, he does a miracle and it's to destruction, it's to death, right? So there's, there's difficulty there for people to understand. Here's Jesus who usually, like, what do we see Jesus doing most of the times? Bless you. Bless you. You're blessed if you do this. It's the first time we hear Jesus curse. And not only curse, but it's like he curses a poor fig tree. Well, what did the fig tree do, right? Curses a poor fig, uh, fig tree and it withers and dies. So there's, there's people have issue with that, right? Why is Jesus cursing? Doesn't he only bless and then, of course, Jesus goes on a rampage, and he starts flipping tables. He's driving people out of the temple, which if, just imagine someone coming to your church, coming to Jaffrey, and doing that here, right? Like, imagine that, how socially offensive that would be to us, for someone to just come in here and do that kind of stuff, right? This stuff happens in the Korean church. It doesn't happen in Chinese church, because we're, more, we're nice here. We're nice like that, but... Like, imagine if someone came here and started doing that. It would be, we would be outraged. This is, this is not acceptable. And yet, in this passage, that's exactly what Jesus does. He's flipping over tables, and he's 
He's pushing people out of the temple. He won't let anyone carry anything around the temple. And today we're going to look at, yeah, we're going to look deeper into this passage. Is that what this passage really is? Is that is an anomaly, an outlier that maybe, maybe you might think, okay, this actually doesn't belong here. We should just take this out of the Gospel of Mark, right? What is this passage all about? So let's begin. Uh, Jesus has just entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey in what we know as the triumphal entry. And he makes a visit to the temple. So we're going to save the triumphal em- entry for when we get closer to Lent. But just know that that's what happened the passage before. Goes into the temple. Then he retreats to Bethany, which is about a two-hour walk away. I looked it up on Google Maps. And then he... it's and. On the way to Bethany is actually the Mount of Olives. So like, those are key spots, right, in this, in this last part of Jesus' life. He goes to Bethany, and he's on his way back. And it's on his way back he encounters this, he gets hungry, right? He needs a snack. And he encounters this fig tree, and he goes to check if there are any figs on this tree and finds nothing because we're told what? It's not even the f- season for figs, Right? And then he curses the fig tree by saying, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And if you just look at this on the surface, this seems like completely unreasonable, right? Completely unreasonable. It's not the season for figs. Why would you go and check for figs, right? It doesn't make any sense. It's completely unreasonable. And then you curse the tree. Like, it's not the season. Why would you even, like, it's obviously not the season. Why would you curse it for not having figs when it's not supposed to, right? That's what it seems like on the surface, but if you look a, a little deeper, there's actually more going on here than meets the eye. Jesus is actually not that unreasonable for going over to the fig tree and seeing if there's figs. Because what is the indicator that it has figs? The leaves. Fig trees, when they leaf, it's usually the indicator that there are figs to eat. That's why Jesus goes over. When he, it says when he sees the leaves, he, go, he goes over. But then he finds that there's, no, there's nothing there. And then he curses it, right? But that still leaves us kind of like, it's not a, si- a satisfying enough answer because it doesn't deal with the cursing aspect of it, right? Okay, so you went over. You, you looked to see if there were fruit, and there was none. So but why curse it? Why curse it to death, Right? Cursing is not new to God if we read Scripture. So I think a lot of, that a lot of this passage, you're going to find that in order to understand it well, and many passages in Scripture, the thing that we always say in our church is that the greatest commentary to Scripture is Scripture. The best way for you to understand Scripture is to read other parts of Scripture, right? If you are just a careful reader, you'll realize almost all of it All the explanations are in Scripture. So it's so important for us to not just read certain passages, but to know all of Scripture. It's going to help you understand um, Scripture better, and it's going to give you a more robust understanding of faith. But as we um, look at Scripture and look at this theme of cursing, God cursing, you'll find that this is not abnormal. This is not an anomaly. From the very beginning, we see God curse, right? In Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve sin. What does God do? He curses the ground where that he curses the ground and makes it so that making a living, working would now be a pain, right? That's Adam's curse. The book of Deuteronomy is filled with warnings to Israel about curses that will come to them or come to anyone in Israel who sins in certain ways. Psalm 37 speaks of the wicked being cut off from God because they are cursed. Jeremiah is also full of curses from God because of sin. And if you know the book of Jeremiah, it was one of the darkest times in Israel's history. So this is not like, it completely throws out of the, throws away this this concept that Old Testament God different from New Testament Jesus, right? Right? In the Old Testament, we see God cursing, and in the New Testament, we see in this passage, Jesus curse. 
But even with this explanation, it's probably still a little bit unreasonable for us because it's like, it's just a tree. Like, this is not a person, right? What sin did the tree have that you would curse the tree, right? Understand if someone's wicked and sinful, right, that God may have a curse one, but this is just a fig tree. Like, Jesus, what are you doing here? Still leaves us in a very, like, confused, kind of unreasonable understanding of this passage. And ultimately, yeah, it's going to be unreasonable until we start begin to read this passage along with the next two passages that follow. Right? And we know that this is the way it's meant to be read because they use something called a sandwich technique. Mark is using a sandwich technique that he has used before because if you remember before the story of um, the ruler of the synagogue has a daughter who's dying, calls Jesus, right? So that's the first part of the sandwich. In the middle is a woman who has been ple- bleeding for 12 years. That's the middle part of the sandwich. And then the end, he, Jesus comes back to the 12-year-old girl that's the daughter of the synagogue ruler, and then the, the passage ends, right? Sandwich. Same thing that's happening here. He starts with the fig tree, this scene with the fig tree. He goes to the temple, and then at the end of this passage, he comes back to the fig tree, the sandwich. It's meant to be read together. And when we read it this way, then it's going to begin to make more sense to us that what Jesus is actually, what's being conveyed to us through this passage is not simply a Jesus doesn't like fig trees that don't have figs, right? That's, that's not what this passage is about. Because what is the next passage about? Jesus cleansing the temple, right? We have to read it with both. And it's very much like if you read the Old Testament prophets, it's very much like that. You know, Old Testament prophets, God gave them visions, right? Or God gave certain things to use as an example um, in their ministry. So, for example, uh, God gives Jeremiah, he's, he gives him a vision of a plumb line. Do you guys know what a plumb line is? It's like, it's like a string that has a heavy object on the bottom to make a straight line. So this is how they constructed like straight vertical buildings. But when Jesus gives Jeremiah that vision of a plumb line, is he saying, okay, Israel, I want to talk to you about your buildings here. Like your architecture needs some improvement. Like your, your, your buildings are not vertical. Is that, what you, is that what God wants to convey to his people? There's a message, actually, a spiritual message he's conveying, using that as an example, right? God says to Ezekiel, gives him a vision of dry bones. Now, is, is God saying, you know what? Can I teach you something about um, human anatomy? I want to give you a, a biology class, just real quick, with this vision. I want to talk to you about um, the possibilities of reanimation. Is that what God is saying? No, he's talking about their spiritual condition, and he's talking about the restoration he wants to bring into their lives, right? He has a spiritual message for them, but he's using these earthly kind of things to to minister to his people. And that's the same thing that's happening in our passage, right? The fig tree is just a lead-up to convey something to us that's happening at the temple as well. The same way that the fig tree had an appearance that it had fruit. So the fig tree Jesus went over because it had the appearance, right? It was in leaf, had the appearance that it, was gonna, it had fruit. But when it went over, it had nothing. That's what we are to understand about what happens when Jesus goes to the temple. When Jesus goes to the temple... Which is, supposed to, which is, what is a temple? It's the central place and headquarters of God's presence. It's supposed to be the central place of worship. And when Jesus arrives in Jerusalem, he finds a lot of religious activity that is even, it's even needed and necessary activity too. But it's ultimately fruitless. See, that's the point. That's the point that this passage is making to us. These sellers in the temple provided a service to provide animals for sacrifice so people could worship. Think of it this way. They were the religious convenience store of of the temple, right? Religious convenience store, when you go to buy, like what are convenience stores? 
for convenience, right? They're closer. You don't have to drive all the way to the supermarket sometimes. There's like one probably right in your neighborhood. You go to the convenience store, but you do have to pay higher prices because what are you paying for? Convenience, right? You didn't have to drive all the way to the convenience store, I mean to the supermarket. That's what, that's what this was. Instead of the, going through the trouble of bringing your own animal to the temple for sacrifice, instead of going through the hassle of, of making sure that your animal is kosher for sacrifice, why bother with that? I just go to the temple, I'll buy it there, and then do my sacrifice. It was the convenience store of the temple. And all this activity, it had the appearance of worship and supporting worship. So what is so, like, what is so wrong with it that Jesus begins to flip tables and drive people out? We find the answer when Jesus quotes Scripture in response to what he sees. He says in verse 17, Is it not written, My house should be called a house of prayer for all, all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? If you know the temple, it had four distinct sections. The most inner part, part of the temple was called the Holy of Holies. That's where God's presence dwelt. The high priest could only go in there once a year, right? Outside of that was a temple and the um, temple courts. Only priests and Jewish men could go there. Outside of that was the, was the court for women, right? Only Jewish women, that was only for Jewish women where they could worship and pray. And then finally, outside of that was the court of Gentiles, which actually was the biggest area of the temple where Gentiles, non-Jews, could go to worship and pray. But here's the thing. That's where they set up shop. That's where they set up their convenience store in the court of Gentiles. So imagine with all the animals that are there, with all the noise that is there, with all the selling and buying, you think Gentiles can worship? Some scholars actually think that this was done on purpose to drive Gentiles away, to make it exclusively Jewish. I'm not sure if that's true, but some scholars believe that. There was nothing wrong with the service itself. Right? There's nothing wrong with the service itself. You can make an argument that this, this was even needed. But what it revealed was a lack of heart for worship. Because they were doing this in a place that you can tell their priorities were all wrong. This was supposed to be the place reserved for just worship, for prayer. And here they were thinking of other things prioritizing other things that was masked with religion, that was masked in what appeared to be worship. So once again, there was all this religious activity. It looked like this is, this is about worship. This is about worshiping God. But like the fig tree, it had leaves. It had the appearance. It had leaves, but it had no fruit. Jesus also quotes from Jeremiah 7 and calling what is happening at the temple as a den of robbers. Now, I've always grown up, um, this is the first time I've actually really dug in and studied closely this passage, and I've always thought that den of robbers was pretty literal, that it was that these um, sellers were um, cheating the buyers of the temple. There's actually nothing in the text actually to support this other than the term den of robbers. Um, and the term is not to be taken literally. And you'll see why this, this can't be the reading. To take a literal reading of Den of Robbers, it, this can't be the reading. The term, I think, is often taken literally, but you have to actually read it in the context of where Jesus is pulling it from, Jeremiah 7. So what is happening in Jeremiah 7? Jesus tells Jeremiah, hey, Jeremiah, can you go stand by the temple gates? I have something that I want you to tell the people. Tell these people that saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, that you put your trust in the temple, tell them that that's worthless, that you should be trusting me, right? 
There's something called Zion theology where people just trust it. As long as the temple is there, they just trust that God's presence is there. Nothing bad will ever happen to us. Ju- Jerusalem will never be defeated, right? And that's what was happening in Jeremiah's day. They're just saying, temple of the Lord. We trust in the temple. So they were going there to worship, so-called worship. But you know what was happening in their day-to-day lives? So on Saturday, they're like, yes, we're, we're going to sacrifice and worship and do, and do all that stuff. But you know what's happening Monday, like Sunday through Friday? So their Sabbath is on Saturday. Jewish Sabbath is on Saturday. They were stealing, murdering, cheating, committing adultery, worshiping Baal and other idols. They had the appearance of worshipers because that religious cult had never stopped. It just continued. Those practices never stopped. But God says this really isn't worship. Right? Your life is not really about worship. I know you think your life is about worship because you're doing this, you're doing all the acts, all the rituals every Saturday. But Jesus says your life is really an abomination because of all your sins. And this is where Den of Robbers comes in because he's like, okay, so do you think my house is a den of robbers for thieves to gather and hide? Like, why are you coming to the temple? Why do you keep coming to the temple with this appearance, this facade? Is it because you think this is a place for thieves to hide out after they've stolen? And G- Jeremiah 7, it, like, it's it absolutely consistent with what's happening in our passage. To have the appearance of worship, but actually when you really dig in and, and God looks down, there's no worship there. It has the appearance of worship or fruit, but instead it's actually just a gathering of sinners. And here's another thing. If it was literally den of robbers, where that's what, that, what Jesus is referring to is that um, they are price gouging and extorting, then he would have only driven out the sellers. But read our passage. He drives out the sellers and the buyers. If it's about people ripping other people off, the buyers are the victims. The buyers are the victims. Why would Jesus drive out the buyers? They're just innocent victims being victimized by extortion. No, Jesus, the whole thing is corrupt. This whole thing is corrupt. This whole thing is a den of robbers. This whole thing is a gathering of sinners. That's what Jesus is saying. And that's why Jesus drives out both He's driving on everyone. He's like, this is a farce. This is not worship. This is offensive to me. And this is probably what's most obvious in this passage is that it's a warning. It's a warning for us this morning against a similar kind of trap in our discipleship where we have an appearance of worship and not, we're not, when, I, when I say worship, it's not just singing and a service. It's talking about a life of worship. We can have an appearance of worship or having a lot of re- religious activity, but that is not equal to knowing God and loving Him and truly worshiping Him. Passion Conference that we just went to, and I know I'm talking about, I've talked about Passion Conference the last two weeks now. Um, it just so happened that I fit this week. I'm not trying to, I don't purposely try to talk about Passion Conference every week. But it just so happened to fit this week. You know, they're on the cutting edge of um, media, production, speaking truth um, creatively. We went to Passion. You know that me and six of us, we went to Passion this, this year. Um, when Passion Conference begins, they usually begin with like a powerful, like an ins- inspiring like video and then usually after the video intro is done, then like all the lights just go up. 
you know, they go, they go full into worship, and you just see like 55,000 people, 55, people just ignite in worship, right? Just ignite in singing. And I've shared like some of those intros with people in our church. Uh, I think I shared one even last year, you know, that was like really powerful. So this year at Passion, I'm sitting beside Olivia, and Olivia, like, we're just minutes away from Passion about to begin, and Olivia says to me, like, oh, I can't wait for the intro of Passion this year. Like, I remember you um, showing me previous um, intros to Passion, and, and I'm just, I can't wait for it. And I was like, yeah, like, I can't wait. I can't wait to see what they do this year. Conference begins with just a simple video. Uh, nothing spectacular, and then all the lights don't come up. There's one spotlight on one worship leader with one guitar. He starts playing his guitar and singing the heart of worship. And to be honest, like, this is how much of a sinner I am. Um, my first thought was, oh, darn, <laughs> I hope Olivia's not disappointed. That was, like, underwhelming. That's so underwhelming. But as this monster conference was being stripped down to one spotlight, one guitar, just voices singing, I'm coming back to the heart of worship, it became a powerful moment. Why did it resonate with people? Because if we're singing, I'm coming back to the heart of worship, it means that it's a confession. It's really a confession. If you, if you mean it truly, if you sing those words and you truly mean them, it's a confession. It's admitting, you know what, I'm in the wrong place and I need to get to the right place in my life. It's a confession that my worship is flawed. I have, sometimes I have an appearance of worship, but I'm not a worshiper. I don't have that true adoration for Jesus, as we sang this morning, that Jesus has captured my heart. It's admitting that. And I believe it resonated with tens of thousands of Christians and Christian leaders at the conference because I believe it's the cry of our heart that we often experience a struggle in our love and worship of Jesus. See, here's the thing. We can get so busy serving in the church for the praise of God's glory and ironically lose out ourselves on a true life of worship in the same way that it was happening to the people in our passage in the same way that it was happening in, the, in Jeremiah's day. And Paul even says it like this, like some of the things can be even as important as preaching. Paul in a different context says, you know what, I know I can preach, I can preach to people, and be disqualified at the end. He says, I don't want to do that. I don't want to preach to people and be disqualified. Even in something as important as preaching, you can find yourself disqualified. And I think we're less, we're less naive about that these days because we've seen that happen. We've seen it happen publicly, like so many public pastoral figures who are preaching, and we realize later, they got disqualified. We can have all the appearance of being about worship, but there's actually an absence of worship. And I say this from personal experience, and I want to say this to every person who's serving or any person that's in, in Christian leadership. It's actually really disturbing. It's actually sometimes like really disturbing how easy it is of how much I can do, how much I can serve, how, how far I can go before I get to the end of myself and I can no longer deny that this isn't about God anymore. This isn't being fueled by God. Please take a second to reflect on that. It took me, I was in ministry seven years before this ever came up on my radar. Seven years. 
seven years of ministry where my focus was not on am I worshiping? Am I living a life of worship? Do I adore Jesus? I knew about responsibility. I can be responsible. I'm a first son. First, first, first sons, older children are usually very responsible. I knew about responsibility. I knew about getting things done. And I, I, I think, yeah, like in the Chinese church, we're busy for sure. Don't give me more work. I'm not asking for more work. But in the, in the Korean church, it's the Chinese church on steroids. I did that for five years. Ministry on steroids. I don't even know how I got through it. I just didn't know any better. I didn't know that there was a, something different outside of the Korean church. Right? It's disturbing how much I did, how much I served, how far I went until I got to the end of myself and God said, your life needs to change. This is not real. We also need moments, that's why we also need moments where our lives are stripped down by getting alone with God, to getting back to the heart of worship and making space for God to cleanse us and minister to us. And hopefully that's what's happening in our worship as we gather together as well. There's nothing like having our own people lead. There's just a personal connection there and, a, and a, a love and a care that you get from your own people leading worship. So I, I love our praise teams. But do we have a full band every week? Is it flashy? Do we have an amazing production? We don't. And sometimes I think people will compare our church and say that's a weakness. I've said this before. People say that's a weakness of your church. I happen to believe it's our greatest strength because you won't last here. If that's what you're looking for, you won't last here. You only last here if you're looking for, if you're truly looking to make Jesus the center of your worship. It challenges us. We're challenged. Do you really, is this really about Jesus? And true worship is actually not based on outward appearance because if you, have you ever been around people who are just like, you know their life is about worship? They will worship anywhere. They will worship anywhere. It's not about an, true worship is not about an outward appearance. It's about an inner reality. It's about, it's about a dynamic between you and God that you know. It's about a God that you know that has become so real to you, that saves you time and time again. That's where worship comes from. And we all need moments where, like, everything just gets stripped down. We get to the very foundations and basics. Am I worshiping God? But what do we do with all the barriers to truly worshiping God that we might experience? There's a saying that in order to communicate effectively, we need to know our audience. And that applies to this passage because the audience to the Gospel of Mark is likely Gentiles or non-Jews who are, they think were living in Rome about towards the end of the first century. Um, some people dated between 60 AD to 120 AD, somewhere around there. And there's evidence in the Gospel of Mark that this is definitely a gospel that was written to Gentiles. Why? Because you see aspects of Jewish culture that Mark has to explain, right? So it's obvious that there's certain things that this is a non-Jewish audience. If you go to Matthew and there's certain Jewish cultural elements, they're not even explained. They're like, it's just assumed that you know these things because you're Jewish. So we, we can tell that there, there are evidences that Mark is written to a Gentile audience. Now, why is that significant? Because remember where that religious convenience store was happening? It was in the court of Gentiles, right? And what is the, 
what was Jesus' response to that? Where all this religious buying and selling was happening in the court of Gentiles. Gentiles can't worship there. Jesus says, my house is a house of prayer for all nations. My house is a house of worship for all nations. That's what upset Jesus. And you have to see this from the point of view of the Gentile audience. If a Gentile audience, right, who was in Rome at 60 AD was reading this, it's not all doom and gloom and judgment and warning. You would have been very encouraged because Jesus, yeah, Jesus flipped the tables and he drove people out, but why did he do that for you and me, for Gentiles like you and me? Right? There is a grace here that if you were a Jewish person reading this, you were like, wow, there is, there is a grace here in Jesus who fought for me to bring me close when I was being pushed out, I was being distanced, I was being separated from God. And if, you, if you're still thinking that Jesus is so harsh to flip tables and drive people out of the temple, let's look at the cross where Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Erwin Lutzer, a Canadian Christian speaker and author, commenting on the der dereliction of Christ, that we call that the dereliction of Christ, the, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Dereliction just means like abandonment. But he's, he wrote this, if I could have it up on a slide. He says this, look at these hours on the cross and you are looking into hell. Darkness, loneliness, and abandonment, abandonment by God. See, in order for the true cleansing and renewal of the temple to happen that Jesus said, Jesus became the sellers and the buyers that he was driving out. Jesus became that on the cross. He, he allowed himself to be distanced from God the Father and the Spirit so you and I could draw near. For the first time in eternity, Jesus was separated from the dance of the Holy Trinity so that we could be brought near, so we wouldn't be separated. Jesus was forsaken, so no person on this side of heaven would ever be God forsaken. Jesus went through hell, hell on earth, to bring us close to God, to know him, which ultimately leads us to worship. Now, does this sound like a God who wants to make it so difficult to know him, to come close to him, that it's building up barriers to worshiping him? What is the heart of, do you guys see the heart of God? The heart of God is to bring people close, bring us close to him. I know that there are times where some of us feel abandoned by God, and I've experienced that too, right? But oddly enough, you know who, who can understand you best? Jesus. Because where we only feel abandoned by God, Jesus actually was abandoned by God. When the wrath of God and the penalty of sin was on him, that should have went to us. Jesus actually was abandoned by God, even though we only feel it. And even there, in Jesus, there is a grace and a help for us if we will go to him. But we have to also be aware that the evil one wants us to believe today that God is holding out on us. He wants to build, God is building barriers so that you can't reach him. He wants to hold you down. He only likes certain people. You know the very, the very spiritual people that have everything together, which is nobody, by the way, he only likes those people. He doesn't like me. That's how Satan, Satan's been doing this for a long time. Satan's been doing this from the beginning, by the way. That's one of the main things he did in Genesis 3, right? Adam and Eve, eat the forbidden fruit. God is holding out on you. You're not going to die when you eat that. You're going to become like God. God doesn't want you to be equal to him. He's holding out on you. There's goodness that he's keeping from you. He's holding you down, guys. Come on, you guys have to eat this fruit. 
Satan has been doing this a long time. He's telling you, yeah, other people might be able to know God, but not you. God doesn't want you, and you can't get there. There's all these barriers, and you can't get there. What is the heart of God? If you believe the cross, you cannot believe that is the heart of God. You cannot. God's heart is to remove all the obstacles to bring us to himself, to be a people for the praise of his glory, to be the new temple and dwelling place of God, which he accomplished in Jesus Christ. When I took a a sabbatical from ministry, it it wasn't just how do I get back to ministry. It was like, forget ministry. It's like I was in such a bad place. It was just like, how do I get myself back into a healthy place with God? And it was like all of the foundations that I had in my life were breaking and destroyed. Everything that I was standing on was just taken from me underneath my feet, like ministry, church, job, money, comfort, stability, all gone, all gone. And there were times where, you know what, I, like, there were times where I just told Mindy, like, I can't do this whole spiritual thing right now. I can't do my devotions. I don't, I don't want to do anything. And all I, but the only thing I could do is, but I'll go to church. So I'll go to church on Sunday. Did I have, like, an amazing um, encounter with God every Sunday? No. I had enough, I don't, I had enough grace or I had enough something in me to go to church. And then there would be one Sunday where God would just speak to me and give me strength to move forward. There were times in the wilderness that I was in where, you know, I can't even read scripture right now. But I feel good enough, like I feel, I feel strong enough, I could read a Christian book, right? And every day that I was reading these Christian books, it wasn't like, oh, the greatest insight of my life. Wow. No, it wasn't. There are many days where I'm just reading through the book. Like, I don't know. I just have, I can't, this is all I can do, God. God, I'm giving this to you. And every day wouldn't be like an amazing insight, but then one day would come where God would just speak so powerfully, undeniably he would speak to me, right? And once again, I have strength to just get through another few days. And there are other days where, you know what, all I can do is say breath prayers. We learned one of them last week. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Or the other one in scripture is, Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. And sometimes all you can do is say these one-line prayers, God, God, this is all I have. This is all I got right now. This is all I can pray right now. I have one line and that's it. Sometimes it's like, you know what, I don't, I can go meet someone. I don't know if I have any, I don't, probably don't have anything else, but I can go meet someone and somehow through that person, God would just speak to me and minister. And there were times where, I remember during that time, like, I just felt, you know what, I know my life is a mess right now, but I can go to that conference, right? I believe, Lord, that if I go to that conference, you'll somehow meet me there. I go, and there there would always be, like, at least one moment, not everything, no conference is perfect, not everything, but there would be one moment where God just ministers so powerfully, the exact word I needed, he meets me, He met me so personally. He made me know I'm here with you. I'm aware of what you're going through, and I'm not ignoring you. Now, did there were stretches of weeks, months, where I get nothing. Remember, I'm in a wilderness. I was in a wilderness back then. So, yeah, those vivid experiences didn't happen to me every single day. But did God meet me without fail? Yes. God met me every single time without fail when I went to him. The heart of God is to remove all the barriers, just like he did at the temple, so that you and I can draw close. Don't let the enemy take that from you. 
Don't let the enemy tell you that there's all these barriers that you're never going to cross. You're never going to know Jesus. What is the heart of God? What is the heart of God? And I don't have uh, the time. I'm probably out of time already. I'm probably preaching too long already, but Jesus and the disciples come back to the fig tree that is withered and dead. And Jesus uses this as an opportunity to teach his disciples about the power of faith, of having faith in prayer, and, and answered prayer, and about forgiving others to receive forgiveness from our Heavenly Father so that there are no, nothing that comes in between us and our Heavenly Father. Now, there are certain things that you're like, this is just all... Sometimes we're so worried about being triumphant that we always have to be very realistic, right? I think we can be triumphant, though. I believe we can be because the Bible is. About having a faith that moves mountains. About having faith in prayer and believing it will be answered. Why don't you, I want to challenge you. Make a list of your things that you're praying about. Make a list and see if it's answered. Sometimes the answer is going to be no, by the way. Just to, just to let you guys know. Some, that, that, that's an answer. That's an answer to prayer. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is wait. Sometimes the answer is yes. To have, to forgive others so that God, you'll know that God has forgiven you so that there's no barrier between you and God. We can live with those beliefs only when you know and trust the heart of God. When you trust the heart of God, you'll start leading into these things. I can, yes, I can have a faith that moves mountains. Yes, I can have faith in prayer and believe it will be answered. Yes, I can forgive others because I know that that will remove everything that's getting in the way between me and God, and believe me, it does. I've experienced that too. I've experienced being, being not forgiving people and seeing how my spiritual life just deteriorates so quickly. Sometimes when we don't see the promises of God, right? Sometimes when these things that we're reading about, about faith, faith in prayer, forgiveness, when it doesn't seem like it's a reality, you know what you have to do? When you don't see the promises of God, you have to trust in the heart of God. I want to ask us to come back to worship. Would you come back to worship to make your life just about Jesus? Uh, Lord, I just want you. I just want Jesus. I don't want all the other stuff. I just want Jesus. Would you take a moment now? I want to give you a moment to come back to the heart of worship. That maybe you have been living a life where, you know what? I know I put off a good appearance but I know there's a lack of worship in my personal life. And that's what this is all supposed to be about. I'll give you a moment. Would you come back to that? Just confess that. Say, God, I know, I know that. I know that I have not been worshiping in my personal life, and I want to come back to a heart of worship and true faith. So I want to give you a moment to, to speak to the Lord, just the words that you have.
God, we confess that we know many of us were not living a, a true life, Lord, where there is a, our life is being lived out of an adoration and a love for you and knowing you, which leads to worship, which leads to prayer. God, Lord, would you forgive us? Not only forgive us, Lord, would you make us new as we turn to you? Would there be a, would, would there be a turnaround in our hearts and our spirits that you would bring us back to the heart of worship then in our personal lives, we would not live out of just doing things and serving, even though the, those are all like necessary things. But Lord, we know that there is a trap that the evil one wants to drag us down into where he makes us very busy. He makes us, he deceives us in thinking that we can do so much, we can go so far without having a personal knowing personal life of worship, a personal life of prayer. So God, as we confess this morning, would you renew us? Because we don't want to just confess and then go back to the life that we were living before. But we're believing in faith, in a faith that moves mountains this morning, that you can make us new. And that's why we're here this morning. Or else this is all just a waste of time. We believe your presence is here to make us new, that your heart is is that you want to remove all barriers for us to know you and worship you properly. So, Lord, we ask for your work to be done in us. Help us to seek you with the strength that we have and that you provide and the grace that you provide. But, Lord, also do that work in our hearts. But we just want Jesus. We just want to live a life of true worship. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen.